Welcome to tonight's webinar, Invisible, Invisible Symptoms, Managing Pain with MS. My name is Brian Thompson, and I am the Programs Manager for CanDo Multiple Sclerosis, and I will be your moderator this evening. CanDo MS is an innovator uh, provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people living with MS and their support programs. Uh, through our programs, we empower people to manage their disease and move beyond their MS by adopting active and healthy lifestyle behaviors. Uh, for more information about Can Do MS, please visit our website and you can learn about not only our online programs, um, but also our in-person programs, which we have a number uh, coming up in 2016. Uh, our four-day uh, Can Do program, which uh, is our flagship program, uh, two-day Take Charge program, and our one-day Jumpstart program. Uh, also on our website, you'll find all of our webinars archived on there, uh, so you can watch this webinar as well as uh, all of our other webinars uh, at, at our website, as well as you can read the library articles. Uh, Deb Miller wrote a great library article uh, in association with this webinar, uh, so you can find that on our website, as well as our different social media outlets. So our objectives this evening, uh, again, we're talking about invisible symptoms and pain management. Uh, so we're hoping to, one, identify three types of pain associated with MS and understand the physical and psychological causes, effects, and treatment options. Two, explore healthy ways to manage pain and incorporate management techniques into daily living. And three, utilize your healthcare team to develop holistic pain management strategies. At this point, I'd like to introduce our two speakers this evening. Uh, first, Deborah Miller is a social worker at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis Treatment and Research uh, at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. She is also an associate professor of medicine at the Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University, where she also received her Ph.D. Among her many professional accomplishments, Dr. Miller helped develop the Multiple Sclerosis Quality of Life Inventory. And Lynn Stazzoni uh, is a nurse practitioner from Boston, Massachusetts. After completing her postmaster's certificate at Massachusetts General Hospital, Lynn began her career as a nurse at the Partners MS Center in Boston, affiliated with Brigham and Women's Hospital. With over 30 years of experience, Lynn utilizes a holistic approach when treating patients with multiple sclerosis, focusing not only on modifying the disease with currently available medications, but also a strong emphasis on symptomatic management. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Deb and Lynn uh, to present our webinar tonight, Invisible Symptoms, Pain Management, and Um We know that pain is a common and complex sensory phenomenon that people living with MS experience. And what we're interested in doing is creating and maintaining strategies for managing pain it as a, an important component of wellness. And we have the first question that we would like to ask next, and that is, have those of you in the audience ever experienced pain that you believe is associated with MS? Uh, please and, vote now. And feel free, folks, you can, uh, you can vote uh, right on the screen there, and then we'll see the responses in live time uh, on the right. Alrighty, so we've got about 150 responses in, and uh, overwhelmingly, uh, 137 yeses and 12 noes. So clearly, uh, this is an issue that many people are facing. Well, the numbers that we saw in the audience are not surprising because it's been well established that about 65% of the MS population experience some sort of pain. Next. And it's important to keep in mind that pain is an internal experience that others cannot see. So that a, anyone looking at you, unless you have um, grimacing behaviors or other um, behaviors that demonstrate that you're experiencing pain, people do not know what your internal experience is so that they cannot be prepared to help you deal with it unless you make um, them aware of the pain that you're experiencing. Uh, and pain is a complicated symptom, and to address it, it is very complicated as well because there are many causes and many treatment approaches. Um, there are three types of pain that we'll talk about. And um, the point of this slide is that there is non-multiple sclerosis-related pain, and it was clear that there were people 
um, in the response group who had not experienced MS-related pain. And then there are two typical types of MS-related pain. One is central neuropathic and the other is non-neuropathic. The point of this slide is actually to emphasize that you should not ignore non-MS pain. Um, Non-MS-related pain can be um, very indicative of other um, conditions that you're experiencing. Um, chest pain is a common symptom of a heart attack and should certainly not be ignored. Arthritis is another common symptom that is not related to multiple sclerosis, um, but need to be treated because they are um, important symptoms that are indicative of other things that are going on in your health. We're not going to talk about these non-MS non -type, non types of pain um, because we are really focused on MS pain, but we want to emphasize that you should not overlook um, non-MS related pain to be aware of the cause and to monitor um, those causes very carefully. Um, then to just cover what are some of the causes of pain in multiple sclerosis. Um, they can be active or old plaques on the spinal cord as well as the demyelinization of the trigeminal neuralgia. Now, oftentimes people have a difficult time describing their pain, um, but it's very important to develop a vocabulary that helps you communicate about your pain. Remember that neither your doctor nor your family can see what this pain feels like. So um, oftentimes, Useful descriptors that we hear from people are stabbing, numb, a numb sensation, electrical shock, burning, throbbing, shooting pain, and pins and needles. Um, so these are some of the types of pain that are commonly associated with MS related to pain. Um, so our next question is, do you experience any of the following pain symptoms. You can choose as many of these as you um, have experienced. Great. We'll give a couple people a couple seconds to uh, let us know what kind of pain they're experiencing, just get a sense. And uh, right now it's pretty pretty well rounded. Uh, a lot of numbness uh, is, is definitely being uh, experienced pins and needles and burning, um, pretty even across the board, though. And I would just like to add that some people might not have considered numbness to be pain, but it is part of the whole syndrome. And this is important as the others. Well, it looks like people have a pretty vo good vocabulary for describing what they're experiencing. And Lynn? So I'm going to cover some of the three types of pain, and we're going to talk about the central neuropathic pain first. Next slide, please. So when you think of a neuropathic pain, you're thinking about nerve injury itself or damage to the central nervous system. And we all know that MS is a central nervous system disease. So the examples of this would be headaches or optic neuritis. If you've ever had an optic neuritis, you know that it's inflammation of the optic nerve that can be quite painful, usually behind the eye, where you might have a sensitivity to light as well or more pain with eye movement. And this is an important point when you look at on the slide continuous or episodic, just as much as it's important to describe the type of pain, it's also important to describe to whoever you're talking to, as such as your provider, whether this is constant, whether it's intermittent, and the duration that it's actually been happening. Next slide, please. So, some of this pain could be um, described as tingling or burning or aching. Some people have also described it to me as a sense of like almost like they have an itch that they really can't scratch or uh, a, a pressure. 
um, it's abnormal sensations and it can occur just on its own or sometimes it's ag actually exaggerated by touch. So something that might have felt good to someone in the past, if they're touched in that same area and they're having this syndrome going on, it actually um, causes more pain. And Lynn, isn't it true that that kind of pain can happen um, during um, sexual activity? Yes, and that, that can be very complicated, complicated for the relationship. Exactly. That's a. Re that I was thinking that uh, that's a, such a good point in the back of my mind that when we're talking about like some people would feel very um, good with certain touch and uh, intimacy that no longer feels that way, and that can be very distressing. So we'll talk about. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Deb. And difficult to talk with your partner. Oh my about. gosh, yes. And even your provider, right? I mean, yes. sometimes. And if exactly. the provider doesn't bring it up, you don't necessarily bring it up. But So the pain can be episodic, so it can be sudden. Um, and I know I'm going to talk about trigeminal neuralgia in, in the next slide, but this is where it can be a, like someone is actually sticking a knife into your jaw or uh, it can feel like an electric shock, such as when oftentimes if people will bend their head forward, they get the sensation of electricity going down their spine. It could radiate to one of the extremities. And this is sort of thought of as like short circuiting. So your body is actually, it's not like when you put your finger on a hot plate and you feel burning, the signal goes back up to your brain. This is short circuiting. So your body is actually telling you there's a pain there that's really not there, but that's what it feels like. Um, there are certainly medications that are available and other treatment options. And for the trigeminal pain, certainly you would start with certain oral medications, which we'll go into in a bit. Um, but there also can be surgical interventions that can help uh, neuropathic pain as well. So some of the non-neuropathic pain can be muscle spasms. And think about if you, let's say, are walking with an assisted device, such as a walker or a cane, you're doing that because one side or both sides are weaker, so you're throwing your gait off, and in return you're going to you may cause some back pain or joint pain. Um, oftentimes if people don't exercise and they be, are weak, they become deconditioned, which can also cause pain when you try to start to do some exercising. And I think all of this can be stressed uh, because of that on your bone structure. I was talking with a patient the other day who he has left hemiparesis or weakness on the left side, and he relies greatly on his right side to help with his ambulation, which in turn has caused a lot of stress to his right quadricep muscle or the muscle above the knee. And it's really caused him to have pain in that knee and more spasticity because he's using his stronger side, uh, which is really taxing that side as well. Next slide. So you could... Uh, the acute pain, sometimes it, it is protective. So in, in the case of the uh, gentleman I was talking about, his body's saying, you need to slow down a little bit. You need to pay attention because now the leg that is your stronger leg is really hurting. So you need to, in, in this case, go to physical therapy. Really think about being kind to your uh, right or stronger leg. And really think about stopping the activity, if you can, as much as you can, that's causing the pain. Because unfortunately, if you don't pay attention to the acute pain or the pain that's sudden, it can become chronic and cause more problems down the road. Next slide. And when we move to chronic pain, we're dealing with a condition that is more difficult to treat because we don't have the pharmacologic approaches or to deal with it, and it's not useful pain. It's pain that um, is there because um, it's an ongoing closed circle of um, both physical and psychological factors that you're living with that cause this pain to be constant. Um, when a person lives with chronic pain, they certainly face um, 
any number of doctors and hospital visits, which can be both um, expensive and frustrating because most physicians are not trained to deal with chronic pain. Um, chronic pain can lead to a lack of enjoyment um, in your relationships and can also lead to general health worries. And the cycle of pain that we see that really makes this pain so tight, and I am clenching my fist as I say that, is that when a person experiences chronic pain, um, it's very typical for them to develop sleep problems because the chronic pain disturbs their sleep. Um, And that can be cramping. um, It can be other pain in any part of the body. And when we're not sleeping well, people tend not to cope as well. Um, And that can increase the pain because we're not doing the sorts of pain management behaviors that we'll talk about a little bit later on. And when a person increases, has an increased sense of pain, it's very natural for them to have an ex- a heightened sense of anxiety, which leads to this circle um, of anxiety, sleep problems, difficulties coping, and increasing pain. And as that circle gets tighter, the problems on the inside of the circle, the worries about employment, the worries about medication um, become more pronounced. So it's important that we pay attention to these psychological factors which are well accepted and respected in the pain treatment community as being very real and an incredibly important part of the treatment management program. Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the psychology of pain. Um, Pain is a complex experience that is not only influenced by the tissue damage and the lesions on your nervous system, but by an individual's thoughts, feelings, and behavior. These emotions um, are um, how we, the effects of what we think and do, the behavior um, can really be limiting in what we try to do to relieve pain. Um, Pain behaviors oftentimes um, can be just visual manifestations of the pain that you're experiencing trying to communicate that to other people, even if you don't realize it. But both of those lead to um, distorted thoughts about what you can do to effectively manage your pain. As I said, your thoughts and feelings can influence your pain level. Um, Some examples of unhelpful thoughts that very typically come to mind when people first begin to experience chronic pain um, are things such as, I'm helpless to manage my pain. Um, Imagining that there's no possibility of finding a positive in your life when you're experiencing this pain. Sometimes people think that if they can't manage their pain, um, there's nothing else that they can control in their life. And people tend to catastrophize when they have chronic pain. What if this gets worse? What if I'm not able to do X? So these are the kind of negative thoughts and feelings that can have a direct influence on um, the level of pain that you're experiencing. Now, we've talked a lot about the importance of communication, and that that communication um, can be physical, um, grimacing, clutching of teeth, um, hugging oneself. Um, But that kind of communication is not quite as helpful as direct verbal communication. It's important to keep in mind that you are living with a symptom when you have pain that is invisible and that other people, um, unlike the dude from Back to the Future, um, are not mind readers. So although treatment of chronic pain is challenging, good communication can promote adherence and improve outcomes. 
And that's part, the beginning of that communication is to be able to describe your pain experience, whether it's episodic or chronic or continuous, and its duration. Explain to the best of your ability what you're feeling. And to the extent possible, um, in this doctor's office, try to be clear, calm, descriptive, and specific. I have to tell you, I had a patient who was in my office recently who was trying very hard to do that, but she was in such pain that she just needed to let me know how miserable she was before we could start talking about the specifics of the pain. And I think that as healthcare providers, it's important for those of you, uh, those of us that you are coming to for care, need to understand that your first reaction when discussing pain with us may not be calm and sensible. And don't be embarrassed if you have a very emotional reaction when you finally start talking about your pain. That's common, um, and a good provider would sit with you and share that experience with you before moving on to really doing a thorough explanation of what the pain is that you're experiencing. So saying that it hurts in a really loud voice probably reflects the frustration that you've experienced of living with this symptom for so long. But it's not, a, it's a good start, but it's really not particularly helpful to us. So we need, as providers and as people who come, who are living with MS, we need to move on beyond that it hurts message. So just to uh, comment on that as well, I think that is so important what Deb has been saying, and that's why when we emphasize about really communicating with your provider, because if you can describe your pain as in much detail as you can, it's so helpful to determine what the next step is, such as if someone's complaining of lower back pain and I have them describe the lower back pain, but then I say, do you have any other symptoms? And they say, well, by the way, I've been urinating more frequently and there's an odor to it. I might say, aha, you might have be having back pain because you have a urinary tract infection. Or the way they describe their back pain, it might not be related to their MS at all. It might be related to disc disease. So it's important to really communicate how this feels to you and what are other maybe um, s symptoms that are going on at the same time. So I think looking at pain management is, is it really that maybe you will not be able to eliminate it altogether, but manage it to be able to cope and live a, a good quality of life. So I think this is the point that if it's left unmanaged, I can really affect your emotional well-being. And certainly, as Deb has mentioned before, that it can affect not only how you feel about yourself, but about your relationships with other people. It can affect uh, your cognition or your ability to concentrate. It can also affect um, your mood. So maybe someone would feel more depressed because they have so much pain. They can't get beyond the pain is, how do you manage pain? You can certainly choose more than one. All right, so if folks want to let us know how you go about managing your pain, uh, I think it would be helpful for, for other people to, to hear what's, the, what's working for you and what's maybe not working so well for you. Another couple seconds here, about 130 responses. Righty. So it looks like medications and exercising along with stretching, um, about three quarters of the, the respondents. Um, but also it looks like acupuncture and um, electrotherapy is uh, actually get some responses as well. So 
how can we move on? We've been talking about how it can negatively affect one, but we want to move forward and think about the positive things that we can do and how can you manage this pain. And it's really looking at skills that you've maybe had in the past, strengths that you've had. Um, probably MS isn't the first hurdle that has happened in your life and really look towards resources such as family or friends to help with this. I think looking at relaxation and this uh, could also include massage which can be, which can be very helpful. Uh, breathing techniques like when Deb was talking about feeling anxious when you're first describing the pain, really look at how you can take a deep breath and take it in and really sort of put pain in its place. Um, pain is just a part of what you're experiencing in your life. It's not your whole life, although at times it probably can feel that way. And using mindfulness to really bring you into the moment and maybe some guided imagery. All these are learned behaviors and, pe and can be difficult, but I, there are always people out there who can help guide you through these techniques. So looking at, um, which can be helpful for some people, it could be writing a log or um, keeping a diary or using some of the apps that are there as well as a Fitbit, but really looking at are there certain activities that aggravate the pain? What is your level of pain? And we, there is a scale from 0 to 10, 0 being no pain at all and 10 being the worst pain you've ever experienced in your life. And how do emotions and uh, reflect to when you're having the worst pain in your life? What are you feeling at that time? Uh, another thing is to look at sleep because if you get poor quality of sleep, one, because of pain, or you don't, or you're more tired, you're going to actually, the pain will be more um, exaggerated uh, and harder to deal with. Next slide. So looking at your activities in general, um, maybe certain things that you do if you are moving at a faster pace can aggravate the pain or the sensations. Uh, really looking at taking breaks in your life, uh, building in rest periods. Sometimes if you're having a good day, you might try to do too much in one day and then pay for it for the next two or three. So really trying to pace is extremely important. And then uh, breaking things down into manageable pieces, it's sort of like thinking about cleaning out your attic. If you had to clean out your attic, it's overwhelming, so you might not ever do it. But if you thought, if I take one box out of my attic and get clean that up, uh, that's more manageable and sort of looking at how you can break things down to really manage um, and not causing more pain. And then re really once again looking at your strengths and what are your coping skills. So certainly uh, yoga is really important in meditation. Stretching, um, especially for pain that's referred to as spasticity or muscle spasms can be very helpful because it breaks that cycle, it breaks that nerve signal going down when you stretch a muscle. So it can really relieve that with no side effects. Stretching does not cause side effects as some of the medications that I'll talk about. Uh, and, the, and certainly in yoga this can help. In, in meditation it's really being mindful and bringing your uh, focus down towards yourself and how you relate to the pain. And Deb, I don't know if you have anything to add to that as far as the meditation or? Um, well, I'll speak about it a little bit more. But actually, it is, it is important during yoga and during meditation to pay attention to your pain, to be aware of it, and to experience that it doesn't have to control you, um, even though you know that it's there and it's part of what you're doing in the moment. Great, thank you. So you can break down uh, pain management into non-pharmacological, which we've mentioned a few already, and pharmacological. So looking at, at all of this probably can improve somewhat on our posture, which can help with back pain. Um, and seating, if someone is, uh, needs to use a wheelchair and they're not seated properly, it can definitely cause back pain as well or problems with extremities. I think physical therapy is such an important part of care because they really work with the individual on gait training and using the assistive devices that can help eliminate poor posture with ambulation and or sitting. 
Uh, they can also talk about muscle strengthening, and sometimes people say, well, I get so tired, how can I possibly exercise or do any kind of strengthening or stretching? But in the long run, it does help with endurance and stamina and can certainly help with pain management. A lot of people do acupuncture and acupressure. Um, there are certainly more reputable places, and you want to make sure you go to a good uh, organization to do this, but can definitely help with pain management, including all sorts of types of pain, such as numbness, tingling, burning, uh, pressure, and stabbing pain. There is a TENS unit that provides electrical stimulation that can be placed um, almost like if someone's having, let's say, an EKG. There's a little pad that's put on a part of the body, and this can be put on the part of the body that's having the pain sensation, and it actually sends little electrical impulses that sort of the hope is that it breaks this sort of cycle of the missignaling going through and relieves the pain. This is something that people wear and they turn on and off periodically depending on their level of pain. Then biofeedback can certainly be helpful because you are initially hooked up to certain machines that uh, you, can, you can learn to relax and slow down the feeling of pain, and you get feedback from the devices that help uh, give you positive reinforcement. And then certainly, like I mentioned earlier this evening, that there are some surgical uh, interventions, uh, which is gamma knife for the neurologic pain, the trigeminal pain, or um, sometimes they use cryosurgery as well to freeze the particular trigeminal, in this case the trigeminal nerve, so that you no longer can sense that pain. Some of the pharmacological options include your tricyclic antidepressants. More common are the amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Um, these, once again, interrupt the cycle of pain, so your body actually is uh, not sensing the pain as much. The unfortunate part about these two particular drugs is that they are sedating, so I usually try to prescribe these for nighttime, and, and that's actually sometimes when people experience more pain. Uh, and it can be very drying of the mouth and cause constipation. Some of the uh, antiepileptic medications, which are really more of the first-line drugs that are now used, are uh, Tegretol, or carbanzamine, and gabapentin, Neurontin. Also, Lyrica, which I call the son of Neurontin, is used to help. Uh, the gabapentin, Neurontin, has probably the least side effect profile. And you want to start in any medication at a low dose and see if that's helpful, and then work up to the max dose. Uh, but always start low at first. Um, and this can be very helpful in breaking that cycle of pain. Some of your antispasmodic medications include baclofen or tizanidine. Uh, baclofen is very common for spasms or spasticity, as well as the tizanidine. The tizanidine or Xanaflex is very sedating, so we tend to use that more at nighttime because uh, you kind of get a twofer for one drug where you get to sleep a little bit better and you also have less uh, spasms. We tend not to use the benzodiazepines during the day because those are quite sedative, but certainly can be helpful at night. Uh, another drug that can be used as an antidepressant is Cymbalta, which um, can be helpful uh, not only for depression, but uh, for pain as well. It was more tried in peripheral neuropathies, such as people who have diabetic uh, pain in their feet, but it's found to be helpful also in central nervous system diseases, as such as MS. Cannabinoids, especially in Massachusetts, is a hot topic. Uh, we did pass here uh, a medical marijuana, and for the past three years, the state has been arguing about opening up dispensaries where folks can go and get uh, marijuana. We had our first uh, one open a couple months ago, and they can be very helpful. There are uh, studies done in Canada that have shown that uh, it's very helpful with pain of any kind, and uh, unfortunately, I think there needs to be a lot more studies involved in this uh, to really um, allow people to feel a little more comfortable in prescribing. So for the nerve pain, we sort of mentioned this for the spasticity as well. You would go with the gabapentin, which is the Neurontin. The pregabalin is the Lyrica. Uh, Topamax is another anti-seizure medication. The carbazamine is the Tegretol. 
Those two drugs, you really do have to have your liver enzymes and complete blood count monitored. Um, Lomitrigine, I don't personally use that often because it can affect your mood and maybe that can be helpful in conjunction uh, with uh, mood alterations from pain as well. Some of the antidepressants uh, can be helpful. We talked about the norotriptyline and amitriptyline uh, in the previous slide, which can be sedating and uh, dry up secretions. And oftentimes, sometimes, um, the SSRIs or SNRIs can be used to help with a pain as well. Now, some of the nerve pain that people have don't respond that well to narcotics. It's more sedative than anything, so people are just tired and don't necessarily uh, get rid of the pain sensation. But they can be helpful, especially if somebody's having an optic neuritis, which can be quite painful uh, in the acute phase. Um, but as a general rule, we don't use narcotics, but they absolutely can be, and I, I would think going to a pain management clinic would be the way to go in this particular instance. Some topical anesthetic drugs can be used, uh, such as lidocaine patches over particular areas of the body that are, can uh, be quite painful. Uh, and they have some uh, creams that can be used as well uh, that can also be helpful. Um. Can I add something, Lynn? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, I would just like to say that the issue of prescribing narcotics um, can be a point of contention sometimes between people who come to practitioners for care and the practitioners themselves. And um, in our clinic, we have adopted a policy, and I don't know if this is typical or not, but our neurologists do not feel as if they are adequately trained to prescribe chronic narcotic medication. And for that reason, and because we have a good chronic pain program, um, we refer all people whose pain is such that it requires narcotics to um, a special pain program. And that is not intended to say that our clinicians don't care. Um, that they are dis that they're discounting the pain or the level of pain that's needed um, that requires treatment with narcotics, but that they feel that it's very important to have um, providers who are trained in that kind of chronic pain management treating people with that level of pain. That's a really good point because I think if you are fortunate enough with MS to go to an MS clinic, you're going there because you go for the expertise. If you have chronic pain, you might think about going to people who have expertise in pain management. Um, so that's a really good point. Um, I think if someone's having acute pain, I saw a patient yesterday who was having acute trigeminal pain and horrible jaw pain. And we actually started uh, treating with IV methylprednisolone, and she came back today and just was a different, complete different person. I mean, she could speak. She couldn't speak before because of the pain. She was holding her head up high. She actually ate breakfast this morning because she wasn't having such intense pain. So there, it's not all, always the answer, but uh, especially with acute pain from a demyelinating lesion, it can be helpful. I think one thing going back to cannabinoids, um, I think there's a lot of talk about uh, THC versus CBD uh, ratio, and I know uh, that certainly if you have less THC, you have less of this sort of um, cognitive involvement or the high feeling. Um, personally, talking to a lot of patients, I find that everyone's different and everyone needs different levels of which, and this is why I think we need more research. Next slide. So I think it's very important to partner with your healthcare provider and at least start the conversation, at least try to explain your, uh, your pain as best that you can. And this will allow whoever you're speaking to to really investigate potential other causes outside of MS and or how the MS can be affecting the pain. I think that we need to look at all different modality types. Once again, talking about the lowest dose of any medication and looking for the effectiveness there as opposed to uh, increasing the dose, but do that absolutely if it's necessary. And always keep in mind that everybody 
is different how they respond to treatment, and even that same person responds to the same treatments in different ways from time to time. And it's so important to address the emotional aspects of pain. And in making that transition, um, you may find that what we recommend to manage your pain um, in terms of psychosocial strategies are very similar to the medical strategies that um, Lynn just discussed. So there will be some repetition in this next section, but consider it um, a point of emphasis that what we know about the treatment of pain really involves a lot more than just medication. And what I'll be presenting here is um, some information that is used within the Cleveland Clinic. And I'd like to mention that the, the book, The Cleveland Clinic Way, um, does not address how to manage chronic pain, but describes um, the, the Cleveland Clinic's uh, approach to, to managing um, the entire person um, from acute care through chronic care. Um, so the, the next several slides will talk about some of the ways that we as um, mental health providers talk about managing pain. And um, it is um, similar to some of what Lynn has talked about. It's important, incredibly important, to pay, to take, um, to pay attention to your breathing. The average person and adult takes between 8 to 16 breaths a minute. By slowing down your breathing so that it is between 5 or 6 deep breaths a minute that you're taking, you will really feel yourself relax. It is a physiologic effect of taking deep breaths and breathing out through your mouth that will allow you to relax, which can lessen the discomfort that you feel. Um, it's a very effective strategy, and this strategy is effective not only for managing pain, but also for when people are feeling the anxiety that commonly accompanies the experience of pain. Um, we can't overemphasize the importance of getting a good night's sleep. And oftentimes, pain interrupts sleep, and that can be a vicious cycle. But one of our points of treatment is oftentimes to make sure that um, an individual who comes to us with concerns about pain gets a good night's rest. Um, without enough rest, pain can tri trigger um, pain worse. Without enough rest, pain triggers more worsening. Um, so. It's impossible to say how much sleep is the right amount of sleep for any given individual. Typically, most adults need between seven and eight hours a night. And for the answer to the question, how much sleep do you need, it's the number of hours that you need to wake up feeling refreshed and ready to face the day. The next strategy um, is to exercise regularly. And the type of, of, of exercise that we advocate um, includes stretching, strengthening, and aerobic activities. And we recommend that you integrate these three types of exercise into your weekly routine um, at least three days and potentially five days a week for at least 30 minutes. Stretching keeps the muscles limber and tendons elongated to help with the spasticity or spasms that people oftentimes experience. Strengthening the core muscles in your back, your hips, your pelvis, and your abdomen um, aids balance and stability so that often that can be very instrumental in um, alleviating the musculoskeletal symptoms that people often experience. And Aerobic activity works the most important um, muscle in your entire body, and that's your heart. Um, and um, your heart, when it stimulates circulation, 
um, means that blood is cycling to your muscles and increasing blood flow. Lynn, could you say a little bit about the importance of circulation and the management of pain? So I, I think that it is when you are stationary and you're not moving as well, things kind of pull and don't flow as well. So just like probably some people say, after I'm sitting for a while, when I first get up, I don't move as easily. It's sort of like uh, trying to start, if anyone drives a, a stick shift, it's that first gear that's the hardest to get into. So things need to sort of move along, and then it flows a little bit better. So when things are more fluid, the body just functions in, in a much more efficient way. Is this sort of what you were getting at, Deb? I... Yes, thank you. Okay, and um, not always everybody's favorite topic, but <laughs> it's essential to do your best to battle your tobacco, tobacco habit. And I know that tobacco is an addiction, and it can be one of the most difficult addictions to break. But it's really important to seek out the help of your healthcare professionals in eliminating tobacco from your life if you are a tobacco user. Smoking cigarettes or, cigar or cigars decreases circulation, aggravates any kind of medical condition that can result in pain and it increases sensitivity to pain. Um, it might also interfere with pain medication. This is not true, only true of inhaled smoke, but also of chewing tobacco. Lynn has talked about meditation and a specific kind of meditation that we find as a powerful tool in um, managing pain is mindfulness meditation. And this might seem kind of crazy and contradictory, but it involves observing your pain rather than suppressing it. By relaxing and accepting the discomfort, you may be better able to tolerate the pain you feel. So for 20 minutes a day, sit or lie in a comfortable position in a quiet spot and just be aware, moment by moment, of your breathing the unfolding of sensations, including pain, and your thoughts and feelings. This is not a technique that comes naturally to people and is not easily self-learned, but it's increasingly um, taught in wellness centers and um, as well as with uh, many pain management programs. So it's an it's a it's a difficult skill to develop, and it may sound kind of contradictory that you actually recognize your pain and accept it, but this mindfulness can carry over to many other aspects of your life, including, including managing and dealing with the other aspects of your MS that may not be pain-related. Um, while we typically do not recommend what um, may be very specific diets that are advocated by different groups of individuals, um, the, uh, the, the CAN-DO, can the um, National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and most healthcare providers recommend a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and this sort of diet promotes circulation. It can limit inflammation that may exacerbate multiple sclerosis, and it can soothe aching joints and muscles. Um, it's really important to the extent that you can, and I know that because people are fatigued um, or because they have other physical limitations, it, they're, it may be difficult to do this, but to the extent possible, um, we really encourage you to base meals on whole or min minimally processed foods like vegetables, whole grains, um, legumes, and fruits. 
And sometimes it is easier to ditch the worst of the food that you intake rather than focus on increasing some of these other um, more positive things. So try to eliminate processed meats. Um, red meats should not be a type everyday event. And ref- refined sugar, refined carbohydrate, excuse me, refined carbohydrates like sugar, white bread, and pasta can also be eliminated. Um, I'm sure that everyone has heard this before, but it's beneficial to shop around the outside perimeter of your grocery store. Um, If you pay attention, as you walk around um, a grocery store, the first thing that you come to are fruits and vegetables, um, including potatoes and all kinds of squash in the season, fruits and vegetables. Um, there are a lot of dairy options that can accommodate a lactose intolerant um, diet and the fresh meats. And it's when you get into the interior aisles of a grocery store where you are more likely to find the highly processed foods. So just even something as simple as being conscious of where in your grocery store you're selecting your food, can be a beginning to developing this whole food, plant-based diet idea. And yoga, as Lynn discussed, um, can consolidate many of the other suggestions that we've already made. Um, It quiets your breathing, can reduce muscle tension, energize your body and mind all of which can ease pain. Now, there are many different forms of pain. um, or I'm sorry, there are many different forms of yoga. Um, I was talking to a friend who was just thrilled at the yoga class that she had gone to because it was gentle and relaxing. And the person next to her was angry because she wanted like a heat yoga, beat me up yoga. And that's not the kind of yoga that you should be looking for. You really do want to be um, looking for yoga that is very mind-body focused. Um, And there are plenty of beginner poses that can be found online um, that can accommodate many different levels of disability. And I would like to say that yoga is um, a very typical component of what we offer at Can Do Programs. Be sure to, I don't even think it should be indulge your hobbies, but embrace your hobbies. Um, it's important to take, to take part in activities that bring you pleasure. And that can be anything from gardening to cruising yard sales to fishing to carving wood. There's a hobby for everyone that can reduce stress and take one's mind off of pain. And distraction especially if it's a healthy distraction, um, is a good thing. It's not avoiding your pain. Finding ways to distract yourself in positive ways is really important. And that includes being social. Um, People who interact with others tend to have reduced anxiety and to better better manage chronic pain. Um, So any opportunity to interact with others be that family, friends, or coworkers, is a really important event, both in terms of your anticipation of it, you're making plans to participate in it, and actually doing it. Being social is a great way to manage pain. So in summary, take deep breaths. A good night's sleep is essential. The three types of exercise that we mentioned should be, uh, you should participate in three to five times a week, at least for 30 minutes. Um, really do everything you can to, to tackle your tobacco habit. Um, mindful meditation um, is a learned skill, and I would recommend that you seek out someone who's trained in leading you in that process. Um, eating a whole food 
plant-based diet is encouraged, um, oftentimes called a Mediterranean diet. Yoga is very helpful, especially that which is soothing and is centered towards mindfulness. Indulge your hobbies and be social. Sure. So I think it's very important, uh, important that all the things that we've been saying, uh, we don't want to say that doing medications is the one way to go or to do all the wonderful steps that Deb just went through that really you have to look at all this in a team approach that you want to work as you in the center of, a, of if you can go to the next slide, if you want to, Brian, see yourself as the person in control in the center and you're going to actually take all the people that are around you in this circle to help you to develop your healthcare team. Now certainly not everyone has the luxury to have all these people available to them, but you have to be the one in control that's going to really build your team and utilize each one because each one of those people in that circle have a certain skill, a skill set that can be so beneficial in helping you not only deal with your MS in general, but also with pain. And I'd like to add to that, that while well, you need to have all of these, as many of these people as are reasonable or meaningful to you, it's important to let each of them know about the others who are in your team. Great point. Thanks. So we have another poll question. What do you, uh, who do you access to help manage your pain? All right, and the response is coming in, and uh, hopefully maybe some people will get a, a new idea of someone that they can reach out to um, based on the experience of others. more seconds here. And certainly looks like neurologist is, is big. Um, a little bit of uh, yoga as we, we spoke before. back to those results, please. Oh, yes. Uh, I would say that you know, it's interesting to see these results because I really believe that there are many other practitioners um, in addition to your neurologist and your primary care provider who can be incredibly beneficial in managing pain. And not all neurologists are necessarily aware of a wellness approach. And I wouldn't be hesitant to test the waters by bringing up yourself with your neurologist um, or your primary care provider. Um, what other profession you could bring in to help manage your pain? And if they poo-poo you, go ahead and do it on your own. We didn't have it on here, but we've had a, a few people uh, write in that uh, massages and masseuse are, uh, are really helpful in at least temporarily relieving their pain. Okay. I'm off All my right. board. <laughs> so I think ultimately, I think what Deb was saying is that no one necessarily, unless you're in severe pain and wincing, is going to know that you're in pain. And it's very hard to see what lies below the surface. So it's extremely important to talk about your pain in order to get the help that you need. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lynn and Deb, for, for a great presentation covering a lot of different angles when it, when it comes to pain um, and just a symptom that you can't see. And so it just takes a lot of, of communicating and understanding what's going on and what's the causes. Um, so and thank you, everyone, for participating. We do have time for uh, a few questions. Uh, we're going to just take a couple really general questions. We got a lot of specifics, and, and as Lynn and Deb said, we certainly recommend you bring those specific questions to your healthcare team. Uh, we also have a Ask the Can Do team feature on our website, uh, mscando.org. So if you don't have time to answer your question, uh, you can certainly go onto the website and, and ask your question, and one of our MS experts uh, will try to respond. Um, so we actually got quite a few questions um, about the MS hug and um, this feeling of, of being encased in cement. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, what that uh, phenomenon is, uh, and a little bit about the causes, and, and maybe some of the treatments of the MS hug? So I think, once again, this is the neuropathic pain. So people describe it. Uh, it's interesting over the years how it's developed that name, because I'm not sure if anyone would want MS hugging them. but. It, it feels as though someone's squeezing. It's, it's oftentimes around the abdominal region, but it can be any part of your body where you feel as though uh, there's somebody squeezing your muscle. Um, certainly, there are all sorts of techniques that we mentioned throughout the presentation that can be quite helpful, um, as, such as stretching. Um, it, if it's an acute attack, sometimes it can be helped by steroids. Uh, if it's more chronic, some of the neuroleptics can be helpful. Uh, but certainly doing physical exercise and really doing all the steps that Deb had mentioned can also be extremely helpful in managing this. Doing, um, uh, I know we didn't bring up swimming, but that actually can be quite helpful as far as really ranging your muscles and really getting a good stretch. Excellent, thank you. Um, another uh, viewer asked about uh, when well, we're talking about sleep and pain, and of course fatigue is another big symptom uh, with multiple sclerosis. Um, and she was wondering uh, how MS fati fatigue plays into the pain cycle. No, I think to say. Yeah, you, um, well, I think that they can both can um, can be involved in that same level of psychological distress that leads to anxiety and to difficulty sleeping and to um, more chronic conditions. But to my knowledge, there is no direct um, link between MS-related fatigue and MS-related pain. Certainly, um, being fatigued can limit your ability to participate in some of the exercise routines or some of the other activities that we have discussed today. And with all fatigue management strategies, I think it's very important for a person to pace themselves and to prioritize their activities. And if at all possible, allowing um, a schedule that can make the fatigue manageable that includes even the most gentle stretching on a routine basis can be very important. So fatigue management is important to allow a person time to participate in the pain management strategies that we've discussed today. Lynn, did you have anything to add? Well, I think it was mentioned earlier that certainly if you are more tired, which is a very common symptom in MS, pain will probably feel more exaggerated. So I think you have to look at treating uh, your fatigue as well as pain management at the same time. And certainly there are strategies to treat both that are similar. So in a, in a way you'd be working on two things at the same time. All right, thank you. Uh, another symptom that we talked about was numbness, and we actually had uh, a few viewers ask about numbness on the bottom of their feet. Uh, could you address that a little bit? Is that a, is that a common uh, symptom associated with MS? And uh, just maybe a little bit about dealing with numbness uh, on the feet, specifically the bottom of the feet. 
So I, I think numbness and tingling and burning are are certainly some of the way people describe some of what we call paresthesias or dysesthesias or some of the pain that can occur with MS. And I think it can vary in severity. It can vary in intensity as far as it can be intermittent or constant. And it can be, for some people, just something they say, oh, I have numbness and that's how I, I just live with it. And other people, it really interferes with their quality of life. So once again, describing it to your provider and really going with that team approach to help eliminate as much as possible or at least allow yourself to function in a very positive way is important. Then is there any kind of footwear that may de-emphasize the paresthesia or the pain sensation? I have certainly heard people talk about there, there were these rocker shoes that were available, um, very supportive footwear, but I don't know if there's any real hard data or studies that show one particular uh, shoe or supportive device for pain per se. But if the pain is secondary to, let's say, someone who has a foot drop and is experiencing some discomfort from that, certainly getting some like a, a ankle foot orthotic supportive brace would be helpful. Uh, do you know of any, Deb, that... No, I, I don't. But um, I, I've heard that that some people feel that different sorts of um, lining on their their shoes can make a difference, and it, people may want to experiment with different, either soft or fluffy lining. Right. Well, I, I had one woman who couldn't wear any closed toe uh, shoes; that she always wore sandals, even in the winter, because she said. Anything just touching her feet caused problems, but if it didn't, she was fine. Got a little chilly but um, in the winter, but she found that that worked for her. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we maybe have time for two more quick ones. Um, we actually had a couple people ask um, about going to the doctor and uh, their doctor just sort of dismissing their, uh, their issues of pain, and, and a couple people actually said that um, the doctor uh, doesn't even recognize pain as a symptom at all. Uh, so we talked a little bit about this before, but can you offer any specific suggestions that if your doctor just doesn't even recognize pain as a symptom, uh, what are some uh, communication techniques uh, to really force that issue? Uh, my knee-jerk reaction was to say find a new doctor. Uh, but, but I think, honestly, if... if you go into your, you know, they only have X amount of time to spend with you and you have to sort of prioritize what your concerns are. And if they don't get to what you really want to talk about, then make another appointment. But certainly if someone in, in the MS community as far as neurologists or nurse practitioners or PAs or anyone that you see as far as your healthcare team, doesn't recognize that pain is part of that, that's very old school because that's how it used to be thought of maybe 25, 30 years ago, but not anymore. So, and you don't need to necessarily spend your time educating your provider on basic knowledge. So give them a chance, bring it up and really emphasize to them that it is part of what's going on with you and that you need help. And then if you don't get it, move on. I think that's great advice. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I think I'll just our last question. We had a couple um, people bring up muscle spasms, and they were confused of, about the difference between muscle spasms and uh, spasticity. Uh, so could you just briefly talk a little bit about uh, the difference between the two? So if you think of like muscle spasms, it's if you're sitting and your leg just jerks or your arm jerks versus spasticity where you're, you're, that nerve, the muscle is always firing so it's tight it's just always tight it isn't like a spasm it's so they're very similar and the muscles doing the same thing it's just the uh, velocity and the um, degree of how tense that muscle is but it's treated with the same medicines it's treated with the same exercises um, and all the other uh, modalities that Deb had mentioned in the nine points Excellent. Well, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Deb, so much for joining us this evening, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in and for contributing. Um, 
the, we offered a lot of information tonight, and uh, it might have been a little overwhelming. But the good news is, is we will email you a PDF versions of all the slides tonight, so you can go back and look at the resources. Um, and also the webinar will be archived on our website, www.mscandu.org, along with all of our other uh, webinars. Uh, you can also find our e-news and our question and answer. Uh, if we don't have time to answer your question tonight, please go to the Ask of the CanDo team uh, site on our, on our web page, and you can uh, ask a question to our MS experts, as well as see the library of RLR articles. Uh, we also uh, would like you to visit www.iconquerms.org. Uh, this is a nonprofit that we're partnering with um, to do uh, some survey gathering, some data gathering on uh, with people with MS and trying to figure out a cure and uh, working together uh, with all your insights. Uh, so please visit that website. And then also please visit us on January 12, 2016 for our next webinar um, on exercise and cognition in MS entitled uh, Your Mind is a Muscle 2. And we are excited for this webinar because we are starting a new partnership with the National MS Society. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, have some new and exciting topics uh, with, uh, with an expanded pool of experts from across the country. Uh, so we thoroughly encourage you uh, to tune in uh, on January 12th. And again, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us this evening. And thank you, Deb and Lynn. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Good night.